that screen up there to remind me, and we will go ahead and get going. What we're going to be talking about is what has been the topic of the month in the past from the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee talking about best glide speed. And a few of you that may know me know I fly airplanes and gliders, and there's some speeds that glider pilots use that can be very beneficial to airplane pilots that not so many airplane pilots know about. And that's what I wanna end up covering tonight with you. So we're gonna talk about some things, talking about best glide speeds, and I'm gonna introduce uh, some other speeds to you that may be beneficial and specifically how to adjust that. We'll talk a little bit about power off approaches and landings maneuver wise, which also apply to emergency approaches and landings and some tips and tricks. We do think it'll probably be pretty close to about 75 minutes for the actual presentation tonight. And what I do have is with this, we have a few poll questions. And the first one is for you in an airplane, what is the best speed for a glide? And I'm gonna go ahead and launch this. And this is kind of, we're back again. It, it seems to wrap around every two years, voting season. So we do, we'll ask you <laughs> to vote, vote early, vote often. Um, John and I are in New Hampshire quite often, which you know is one of those states that is early in the primary. So we need to practice. <laughs> you know, practice, practice, practice. So we'll give this just a moment. We got about 50% of you, which we're passing a little over 360 of you online now. Would like to see that percentage get up to 90%. You know, if we could have that turnout for local elections and even presidential elections, you know, the world would maybe be a much better place, maybe as good as it is here in aviation, who knows. <laughs> so we're right about a minute. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll now. And John, you know, I'm going to share it. And let's see. Okay, um, and so I'll be reading the uh, the answers from the poll questions as, um, on Steve's screen. It comes in very, very small, so it's easier for me to see. Um, what is the best speed for a glide? And uh, clearly the number one answer was speed to fly for the greatest distance at 46%. The number two answer was it depends at 32%. Those sound like people that could work for the FAA, Steve. <laughs> it depends. That's um, exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> And then at 11% each is speed to fly for the greatest time, and the two speeds are about the same. And, uh, and at 1%, the speed that gets me on the ground the fastest. You know, and being an FAA person is, I will say at this point, the correct answer is it does depend. You know, <laughs> And that's what we're gonna take a look at tonight. Um, really in relation to this, there's really only one answer that probably is not um, wholly correct given a specific circumstance. And that's probably the one that the two speeds above are the same. That's probably the one answer that is not wholly correct. Most airplane pilots are taught about the speed for the greatest distance. Most are not taught about, about the speed for the greatest amount of time. And you know what, if you're ever on fire, you want that speed that'll get you on the ground as quickly as possible. So that's why, you know, our FAA answer of it depends is it does depend upon the circumstances. So let's go ahead and move on. We've talked about this in relation to it. And like I said, what most people are familiar with is the best glide speed uh, that's given in airplanes by the manufacturer. And what that is, is the maximum range or the maximum distance in still air. You know, the greatest distance covered for the altitude loss. It's often referred to as best glide speed. Usually, uh, even though we don't distinctly define it within the FAA, you usually will see it published as VBG. Occasionally, uh, you'll see it published as VG. And most, uh, airplanes, you'll find that speed is usually roughly halfway between VX, VY speeds. 
And one thing you may also see is that speed does increase with weight, which we'll talk about. Usually for most manufacturers, it's given at the maximum gross weight of the aircraft. And here's just a few examples that we typically see in the general aviation world on what's published as the best glide speed and where that falls into place between the speeds that are given for that. I don't remember exactly what model 172 that's for, uh, but because those speeds do change slightly and even the same thing for a PA 28, 140, 161, 180, you'll see some minor variations in relation to that. Now in the glider pilot world, what we usually talk about is L over D max, which is the lift to drag ratio. It is the greatest ratio of the coefficient of lift to the coefficient of drag. And that's best glide in still air. And emphasis there is still air. Most of us in the airplane world think about still air being lack of wind. But for glider pilots, they not only think about wind from direction, side to side, forward and backwards, but they also think about the movement of the air in an up and down format. And any of us that have flown airplanes on a midsummer day, especially down south, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon with lots of fair weather, puffy cumulus clouds out there can attest that the air goes up and down also. You know, we normally call that turbulence uh, in relation to it. L over D max for any aircraft does occur at one specific angle of attack. And it is possible, although not all of them are designed this way, but it is possible in many aircraft and especially or more so if you have an experimental airplane can probably also rig it to find out what that angle of attack is and then correspondingly have some form of a notification on an angle of attack indicator as to when you are at that specified angle of attack. What you're probably going to find also, and this is just a relationship to it, for propeller-driven aircraft at L over D max, you're going to find your maximum glide distance in still air that we've talked about. You're also probably going to find your maximum range in still air. For a jet aircraft, although most of us are not flying that, usually at L over D max, we'll find your maximum endurance. Now, best glide and L over D max being the same are specifically for distance. In still air, for every foot of altitude we lose, we'll go the furthest forward in our flight path. However, there is another speed that glider pilots are very, very familiar with, but not all airline pilots are. And that is specifically, if we're looking for a glide speed that gives us the lowest rate of descent. Now to think about this, it's the same thing. If we talk about the relationship as VY and VX, the definition of VY is the greatest amount of climb over time and VX is the greatest amount of climb over distance. Minimum sink and best glide are like that. Minimum sink is the time-based one, and best glide, L over D max, I'm using those interchangeably purposely here, is the best glide for um, a distance, like we normally talk about in a VX when we're talking about the climb rate. But minimum sink speed, time related, is the one that gives us the lowest descent rate, you know, that we end up seeing on our VSI, basically. It is slightly slower than the maximum range speed, which is at L over D max, which is at best glide. And in airplanes, is it exceptionally rare to see it cited in the POH? In fact, in most airplanes, I have only seen it.
Now, here's a little tip or trick for you. Those of you that fly airplane single engine land that were certificated under um, CAR Part 3, like your Cherokees and most of your 172s, and even those newer that were certificated under uh, FAR Part 23, uh, such as the newer 172s, diamond aircraft, um, things like that, is pretty much meeting the specifications for certification. It is just a byproduct that you will be at minimum sink airspeed is just about the point if you were to keep the aircraft clean, pull the power back to idle and give it full nose up trim. It'll be low near the stall, but it will not be at stall speed or below it. It'll, it'll be a little bit above an unaccelerated stall speed wings level. So if you're looking for the most time in the air, that's a good quick tip that you can use to actually find that speed or very, very close to it. And we'll talk about even small variations in it. Now, here's something that'll be familiar for the airplane or for the glider pilots out there. And what I'm gonna take a look at is what we have here is a graph that shows us the sync rate in relation to the speed. And this is specifically for still air. We talk about this as what glider pilots, we call it a glide polar. And this is important because what it does is it gives us the lift to drag ratio at any given speed. It also gives us a few other things that we can take a look at. On the low end, and this is just a fictitious aircraft, it, it's a made up aircraft, just to give you an example of what it would look like. At the low end is the stall where in you know 1G flight, we can't fly any slower than that. You know, at the one knot per second deceleration that they have in the certification process to it. What we also can find on this plot of the lift over drag ratio of the aircraft is where the minimum sink speed occurs. And this is at the highest point on this curve, approximately 43 knots is shown here. And then the best L over D is actually the tangent that goes from the zero point to the curve. And you can see that it occurs, say, right about here. You know, I'm not the best artist, so you got to give me a little bit of leeway, one knot or two <laughs> either side. But this is our fictitious aircraft, and it, this is what the lift to drag curve for that particular aircraft would look like. It tells us where the minimum sink speed is right here, about 43 knots, and the best glide speed, which is based upon the tangent. And this is what, you know, you hear glider pilots talking about, well, you know, what's L over D max? What's the polar, polar curve show? Blah, 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 blah. This is what it looks like. And this is how it is. Here's another example. This is the example out of the glider flying handbook. The blue line here is the polar curve, the lift to drag ratio, the minimum sink speed, which will give you the most time in the air in a glide is down here, right about 40 knots. And L over D best glide is at about 50 knots. You know, and we see a few things. This particular aircraft has a much sharper curve or bend on the stall and your lift to drag ratio goes, you know, plummeting. Um, actually, yeah, plummeting is probably a good way. As you get really, really close to the speed, that's fairly um, common. Now, an astute observer to either of these charts will note that the sink rate here is listed over in knots. And airplane pilots are used to thinking about feet per minute, such as 100 feet per minute, 200 feet per minute, 300 feet per minute, 400 feet per minute. Now, there is a specific reason, is we do wanna keep the terminology the same, and believe it or not, is one knot is very close to being equal to 100 feet per minute. 
is if you, you know, divide it out, one knot is 6,076 feet per hour. There's 60 minutes in an hour. So you divide it, you come up to 101.2, you know, feet per minute. Between friends, we can say one knot is the equivalent of 100 feet per minute. You know, and bring this up just because it is important for us to keep like terms. Now, you'll notice this if you ever look in a glider compared to an airplane for the airplane pilots or for the glider pilots. If you ever look from a glider and go to an airplane, you'll see a vertical speed indicator that looks very much like what's known as a variometer. However, what they're showing is in knots. Pretty darn close. You know, if it was rigged exactly the same, it would read exactly the same, but 100 feet per minute up is about one knot up. 200 feet per minute up is about two knots up. You know, 500 feet per minute up is five knots and the same thing. 1,000 feet per minute down is about 10 knots down. Now you'll notice airplanes have a larger scale. Why? Because they have something more than just the atmosphere to let them or to help them climb and descend. They have that engine on it. So the scale is probably much larger on an airplane. Almost identical instruments, but they'll be rigged a little bit differently or set up a little bit differently between a glider and an airplane. Here's your typical VSI, you know, which is connected to the static pressure registers and then has a calibrated leak in the, in the back. Gliders can be rigged this way, although it's very rare. Um, usually they're using something more attuned instead of just the direct static fence to what's known as a total energy probe, which ends up adjusting slightly for if you're pitching over and accelerating or pitching the nose up and decelerating and can even have additional things put into the lines of the system in terms of electronics or calibrated restrictors, which will change a little bit. The internal of the variometer, uh, kind of old school style, is almost identical to it. However, instead of having the calibrated leak that just leaks to the outside in a glider, it will go to a capacity flask. What that means is it's just a large um, open holder of air. That's probably the best way to describe it uh, that will adjust slowly over time to what the outside pressures are if no changes are made. And this is what a capacity flask looks like, almost like a thermos, uh, many of them. You know, it's just a insulated steel container tube because temperature can have an effect on it. And on the glider world, there's many, many differences in how these can be rigged up. So now you're probably starting to think, hold it, do I actually have these two speeds between, for my airplane? the airplane that you normally fly. And yes, you do. You have a minimum sink speed. You also have a best glide speed. You've probably been taught a lot by your CFI to go to best glide speed. You know, how many of us have been out there and had somebody say, you had your instructor, I'm guilty of it because I've been an instructor for years. Oops, surprise, your engine just failed. What are you going to do? You know, and the first thing is fly the aircraft, right? And when we say that, what we're normally talking about and what you're probably drilled to go and do is to go to best glide speed in relation to it. We also do have a minimum sink speed and an attitude that corresponds to that, which we'll talk about. You can go out and experiment, take a look at this. At minimum sink speed, you should be at the lowest rate of sink, you know, feet per minute. Best glide speed will be a little bit higher, but you'll probably be able to sense that you're able to even go further. And it is. It's important whenever you're doing this to use all of your senses. You know, note where the horizon is on the dash. Notice the noise difference in the aircraft. That's a big thing that, you know, glider pilots are taught 
in terms of the differences to it. Notice the changes in the pitch and everything. You know, you can go ahead, you can do this, you know, start at VY or the manufacturer's recommended best glide speed power off and note the speed versus sync rate and then adjust your pitch to reduce the airspeed. You know, if you want to get the most useful information, try to do it at what you typically fly at. And you may find it'll be a little bit different than what you'll see in the book numbers, you know, for your aircraft. Give you a little bit of an idea. This is an example in most airplane single engine land aircraft, what the pitch attitude looks like very, very close to best glide speed is you'll notice that the cord line is almost parallel, very, very close to parallel with the horizon out there. And then for minimum sync, what you'll find is that it's gonna be just ever so slightly higher pitch attitude with the leading edge of the wing up just a little bit higher. And you can actually go out, test this, and you know, try to learn about the senses that you'll feel in the differences between these two airspeeds out there on the aircraft, what the pitch attitude is and stuff. But you also can plot this out and take a look at it. You can write it down and say, you know, well, at 40 knots, we had this descent rate. At 50 knots, we had this descent rate. At this speed, we had this descent rate. You know, and you can go up all of this. Believe it or not, this is an example. I used to be um, director for the University of Cincinnati program. And one of the things we did with our students in the commercial pilot level was we actually had them go out with an instructor and do this and compare and contrast what they found on their flight versus what the book figures were and why the differences may have occurred. And you can find in, available in the downloads is there is a little copy of the spreadsheet that I had that had developed for this so that you can plug the numbers in for yourself if you want to go out and try it in your own aircraft. Um, you know, so you can download the Excel spreadsheet and use that. Also, there's a graph where you can plot it out by hand. And all, all this black line is is the polynomial curve of best fit. You know, so that we said, okay, if we were to take a look at these data plots, where does all of this come out? And actually what we also used to do with the students, because all of the students would do this, is we'd take all the data, not only from each student individually, but we take the data from all of the students and plug it in so that we had multiple uh, data points for 40 knots, 50 knots, 60 knots, so forth and so on. And if you take a look at this, you can actually do something. As a few of you are out there, I don't, let's see if I can do this well. I probably am not gonna be able to do this well, folks. But L over D is from the zero point to the tangent. And if you take a look at where that hits, which we probably will later on, it's somewhere in this area. Like I said, I probably can't do that well is this is actually from a Cessna 152 that a student had done this with. I don't remember who, if you're the student, you know, 20, 30 years later, you can at least see your schoolwork being presented, you know, because it, it, it's nice and pretty. But if you're a glider pilot, really the only difference here is if we flip this over. You know, we took a look earlier, what I was showing you, look, more like this, where minimum sink is at the highest point on that curve, and then talking about L over D max, best glide being the tangent from the zero point. That's the only difference between these. This shows the same thing, just it's the way that it is presented. So that brings up the question, how far can we go in a forced landing? How far can you fly? And most air, general aviation aircraft are in the eight to 10 range. You know, like you hear probably most commonly for the Cessna products is about a nine to one 
glide ratio. Glide ratio is equal to the lift over drag ratio, the coefficient of lift to the coefficient of drag. They're the same thing. A glide ratio of nine to one means you can travel 1.5 nautical miles, which is basically 9,000 feet for every 1,000 feet of altitude that you lose. That is a nine to one ratio. How are we doing out there, John? We're doing well, Steve. Um, the questions are, uh, there are a few questions that have come in. Um, like how do you get these LD plots while hand flying? The ones you just showed. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the last thing you said crystal clear. You say it again. Oh, uh, one of the one of the questions that came in is how do you get these uh, uh, lift over drag plots while hand flying? Actually, th that is a terrific question. Uh, this sort of thing here, as we were talking about, is what a couple different things. I've I've done this multiple times. If you're trying to do it near maximum gross weight in a two seat aircraft, especially bring someone along with you, <laughs> you know, and hold it steady at that speed. You know, usually you want to try to hold the speed for about uh, a minimum of 30 seconds, but preferably close to a minute to let everything stabilize out, do it in super smooth air. The other thing that I've done, if I'm doing it on my own, I just print out the table like a test card ahead of time, literally like what you see on um, the polar thing that you can download. I think there's a little like chart over on the side. I just would print that out and I'd end up marking it down. And you know what? It's even better today. We'll probably see a screenshot or something later with ForeFlight in it, which also has GPS. Nowadays, you, you can have multiple sensors in there that will give you descent rate you know, all the time. You probably will see some differences in ground speed, um, you know, but we'll negate that. But in terms of descent rate, you can take it off of your VSI, you can take it off of four flight probably, have it across the bottom of four flight. Hell, you probably can even get a direct readout GPS wise, you know, on your G3000 um, with it. You know, you have all of that available to you. So we were talking about best glide and L over D is a ratio. You know, it's the slope of the line. All it really is, is the airspeed divided by the descent rate in still air. I have to emphasize that. If we want to look at the slope really of what you're truly doing in terms of distance, best glide wise over the ground, what it would be is ground speed divided by descent rate. And we'll take a look at that a little bit further along. So here's just another example. Again, a made up aircraft. I don't even know if this is the same aircraft we looked at before, but best glide um, is the tangent from the zero point and it occurs at only one speed. You know, if we draw that zero point to the tangent, we get that. And in this particular one, the ratio of lift to drag, which is the ratio of speed the descent rate comes out to about 11.25%. That optimum does only occur at one speed. However, we can fly off of optimum, and what we will find is many times we can have two different speeds. If we go at a lift to drag ratio that is lower, in this case here, what I'm showing is approximately eight to one, we'll find that that speed occurs at two different locations. Is it occurs at 37 knots and it also occurs at 73 knots. Now here's a little tip or trick for you from the gliding world is gliders do not always try to maintain L over D max. That's only in certain circumstances. There are many times if they have a ratio and have enough altitude that they know they easily could make, say an eight to, eight to one ratio, what they will do is fly at the non-optimum speed, like 73 knots, in order to get there faster. Now they truly could do an eight to one glide ratio here, but what is that going to gain them? 
they're descending at a greater rate than minimum sink, right? But still going slower, they're not going anywhere. So you'll find that the glider pilots, usually the absolute minimum speed they will ever fly will be the minimum sink speed, which is, excuse me, again, my drawing is horrible with this. <laughs> um, the minimum sink speed, which is the top of the curve here, the highest point on it, or faster. They will always basically stay on this side of the curve. There's no reason for them to go on the low side, and all it does is it brings them closer to the stall. Oops, I got to erase that little thing there because it's sticking with us. So, as mentioned, remember that L over D is a ratio. It's the slope of the tangent or the slope of the line to the curve. It is generally, as I've mentioned, it's airspeed to descent rate. Um, and we'll talk later about ground speed. You know, that's in still air, such as we talked about the nine to one glide ratio of the 152s and 172s. So it's the ratio of speed to the descent rate. Now, if we put out this problem here, would you be able to figure it out? You know, and like in a Cessna 152, you take the 60 knots, in this case, the best glide speed, what you'll find is the descent rate will be about six and a half to seven knots. In relation to that, you take 60 divided by about six and a half, you come out to about nine to one. You know, and this is also, as I told you before, is from a Cessna 152. We had mentioned, and if you take a look at what would be a tangent on this, you know, it would hit right about the 60 knots and you come out right about, you know, 625, 650 feet per minute descent. That'll give you pretty darn close to nine to one. But let's take a look at the point, the lowest point on this curve, or correspondingly, what we would call the highest point if the curve was flipped over as I was showing you before, and look at what the ratio is at minimum sink. If you draw a straight line across, you'll find that it's at about a descent rate of 600 feet per minute or six knots and occurs down pretty darn close to about 47, 48 knots. And excuse me, I hit the click too fast. What that comes out to be is at minimum sink, your glide ratio is gonna be about 7.7 .7 to one. You're not even gonna go 8,000 feet for every thousand feet of altitude that you do have. However, because you're only descending at 600 feet per minute versus about 650, you're gonna stay up in the air longer. You know, from a thousand feet in a Cessna 152, it's not gonna make a huge difference. But as we all start changing the performance of the aircraft we fly, if you have this circumstance occur at say, 14,000 feet, that's going to start to make a difference in how much time you have. And we'll, that's what I'm trying to get you to think about is don't only think about how far you can fly in an engine out situation. Maybe there are circumstances where you want more time to do a checklist or do something else in order to get prepared for the emergency landing you're facing. And in that case, you may want to fly a lot of your descent at minimum sink. Now, here's just a little overview to give you a little bit of an idea of some of the different ratios that we have. You know, if you're the paraglider type and you're getting out there with the newer elliptical wings, at best, you're probably going to get close to five to one. Most general aviation aircraft are in the eight to 10 to one range. 
you know, your Piper Cubs and stuff are probably much lower. You know, your Diamonds and Cirruses are probably a little bit higher. You get into some general aviation aircraft that are now starting to have longer wings, like the Malibus, uh, TBMs, you're probably getting close to 12 to one ratio, which means for a thousand feet above the ground, you can go 12,000 feet, which is about two nautical miles for every thousand feet. This is about one and a half. This is an even one. Some of your jets, believe it or not, even though the speed is gonna be pretty high up there or in the neighborhood or can get into the neighborhood of 18 to one, depending upon the size of the engines that are sticking out there and everything, which gives you about a three to one ratio glide wise. You know, we can always talk about that Gimli glider. What was that? A Cessna, a Boeing, a Cessna, a Boeing 767 in Canada that glided to a um, former military base? Yeah, that was a 767, Steve. Yeah. You know, is that's a little bit better ratio, believe it or not. It glides a little bit better than your 172. And then, you know, modern day sailplanes, you're looking 46 to 1 or even better. Uh, ratio with it. And believe it or not, you know, many different types of aircraft have been gliders. This is an interesting side note to it, but a, a terrific group that focuses on um, aircraft efficiency and design characteristics. I know they've been doing a lot of work on electric uh, power lately over the last 10 years, but the CAFE Foundation out in California. And back oh, 20 years ago, purposely to try to work on some understanding of glide and how much drag a propeller produced on the glide of a propeller-driven aircraft, if it was windmilling and all of that, they actually set up a Cessna 172 that they removed the propeller off of, but set it up with the engine still installed so that they could tow it and do some glide tests that I'm mentioning to you about here, where I'm talking about just pulling your power back to idle or close to idle and seeing it. You know, and this is from the FAA. You know, <laughs> the, we always say when you become an FAA inspector, you have to start taking notes and write your book because there are things you're gonna see you never really truly will believe. And they come through the door much faster than you could ever imagine working out there in the industry, you know, and it is the case. You you hear all these wild and crazy things, and just when you think you've heard it all, something like this comes walking through the door. And this is what you know. The FA inspector that worked with this group was like, "You want to do what? <laughs> How would you react when that came in, John?" Uh, I I would call you, Steve. <laughs> No, I'm only kidding. Um, yeah, this is, um, I, I, I'm not going to say thank you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, right, 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 right. Yeah, we've we've had stuff like this come through. Yes, yeah, it can be pretty interesting. Yeah, but I do in the handouts there is an article about this if you want to take a look at it. it, it it's funny. It's interesting. You know, you, you'd be surprised. So, hopefully, at this point in time. I at least have you as an airplane pilot thinking in the mindset that you have two speeds available to you. You have best glide speed, which is going to give you distance. You also have minimum sink speed, which is going to give you maximum time. Now, what I want to do, and this is where the important stuff comes in that may help you if you are ever faced with an engine out situation or for those of you that may be doing some of the maneuvers in your testing to help you understand why we do some of the things that we do in the ACS standards, um, why your pilot examiner asks for some certain things, why we do things a certain way, and also how you can expand upon that with increased knowledge. Now, how do these speeds change with weight? Believe it or not, the speed changes, but the tangent does not on this. It's, here's an example of an aircraft, and this is using a glider example, but it can be, and glider pilots 
when they have good lift conditions in competitions, will add ballast. Usually it's in the form of water ballast. And, and what that will do is increase the weight of the aircraft. Here's kind of what the typical polar curve of the glider may look like with outwater ballast at stall speed way down here. You know, it's minimum sink speed down here near 42 knots and it's best glide speed near 50 knots. What happens is the L over D polar shifts still on that optimum tangent line, but moves down hidden by the 50 knots, right? You increase the weight, your stall speed's going to increase significantly. The speed at which minimum sink occurs is going to increase, you know, instead of being like, you know, the 43 knots or something, it's now going to be like 52 knots. Also, the descent rate, if you follow across to the side with the increased weight is going to increase. So you're going to end up, your minimum sink speed will increase. The amount of time you have in the air will decrease but you still will have a speed that will give you for that given weight the most amount of time in the air and that's your minimum sink your best glide speed or l over d max is going to be the same ratio just it's going to occur at a higher air speed in this case here as shown you'll see it occurs at about 70 knots so what happens is it may still be in the case of a glider, 46 to one. In the case of a 172 being flown at maximum weight versus a pilot only with half fuel, you know, at lesser weight, best glide speed is going to change. Best glide speed for airplanes in the manual is almost always given at maximum gross weight. So if you're flying by yourself and you have an engine out and you want to fly at best glide speed, you probably want to be a few knots slower than what the book value is to get your actual best L over D to get your actual true best glide. What about with configuration? Well, again, this particular graph here, and I'll add something to it in a moment, is in relation to flaps. A lot of gliders have flaps, and what they also have is not only flaps that go down to help with the landing or slowing up and decreasing your stall speed, they also can sometimes go in a negative format. And what that does is it changes things significantly, right? Is negative eight degrees, that's flaps reflexed up, is moves your stall speed up significantly, but it doesn't actually change your sink rate all that much, if at all. So what you'll find is in a glider, if they're trying to go faster for a competition aspect, such as getting to a point much, much faster, they will end up bringing the flaps up to a negative setting in order to go faster. They have to be careful that their stall speed has increased significantly, but the speed at which best glide occurs increases significantly also. And airplane pilots may see this a little bit more. Uh, malls have an increased cruise speed. They get the better cruise speed, you know, than you would expect for how draggy they are as an airframe because they have reflex flaps. They have flaps, if I recall correctly, and most of the models go to negative seven degrees. And all of that is, is to change the lift to drag ratio and allow you to have higher cruise speeds. You know, what is interesting about this is 
you know, this is the type of thing if you're at the bar with your pilot buddies or whatever, you know, it can be an interesting conversation to have is, hey, what happens when we change this? What happens when we change that? You know, and you can see the differences that occur. Now, on the airplane side, really what we end up doing is we take a look at something a little bit different. Normally, what we do, and highlighting it here, is we put down flaps, go from zero degrees to 20, 30, 40 degrees. And what happens there? We'll see that our stall speed decreases some. What we'll also see at all given speeds, because of the increased drag, our descent rate for any given speed will increase. So our minimum sink speed will be lower when you put flaps down with it. Also, what you'll find is your best glide speed will be lower, but also because of the increase in drag, the tangent from the zero point to the curve will be lower, and your best glide speed and your minimum sink speed will most likely get much closer together. I.e., if in a 152, I'll use as an example, you know, if your best glide speed is 60 knots clean, the best glide speed L over D max with flaps at 20 degrees may be much lower, maybe down near, say, I'm picking a number off the top of my head, 48 knots. And what this curve also shows you is what happens with the drag. As you put down flaps, you get much higher drag, especially at much higher air speeds. So instead of having a long flat curve, like you see on these gliders that stretches out there, is the curve gets to be pretty steep as a result. And as a result, you have big variations with small changes in speed if you have a steep curve like this versus a shallow curve like that. Believe it or not, the big, big difference in gliders over the past 20, 30 years has not been changes in stall speed, has not been changes in minimum sink speed, even has not been changes in best glide speeds. It has been an improvement in the aerodynamic design to take this portion of the curve and improve the drag characteristics at higher speeds so that it ends up flattening out much, much more so. And as a result, you have little variation in your descent rate over a large speed range i.e. you can be 10 knots off from your best glide speed, but only give up a few percentages in your lift to drag ratio or your glide ratio. That's what the big, big difference has been there. Other enhancements, you know, in the glider world, you'll see this, you see it in the airplane world, and that's what we're gonna talk about too. But many gliders, are out there available where you can buy them with the 15 meter wingspan is a standard. And the next standard is 18 meter. And they design them so that you have wingtips that are interchangeable. And you can see the differences that end up occurring with this. You know, your stall speed with the winglets gets a little bit lower. Your descent rate gets lower. You'll end up with, um, you know, a little bit higher. L over D max or best glide speed versus with the 15 meter wingspan. And depending upon it, you may end up with, as I was talking about, a flatter curve uh, in relation to this. You know, and, and if we talk about it, you'll see this on airplanes. Why have we started to see winglets coming out or things like the Tamarack airfoils like that is because we're looking at improvements in the aerodynamics of it and flattening out that curve and keeping the ability to operate close to L over D max, which gives us the best range in piston powered aircraft, you know, extended wingtips and even, you know, radical designs 
such as changes in the wings. You know, and all of those will have effect on your best glide, but will ex also affect L over D max, which is going to greatly change your range, right? Airliners. You hardly see an airliner come out today that does not have winglets on it. Why is properly designed winglets, you know, allow it to operate near L over D max up at altitude, which will greatly increase its range. We also can have some detriments to it, you know, in terms of detriments to your L over D max or lift to drag ratio, but they may be beneficial for what we're doing in the airplane. You know, some things that you almost never see on a glider, but you see on airplanes is vortex generators. You know, they probably give you worse glide, but maybe a little bit better low speed hand, um, low speed landing and even handling antennas. You know, why do Moonies, why did Mooney change from, you know, individual belly pans to a single sheet aluminum pan to a single sheet fiberglass belly pan with antennas on the inside of the aircraft. It was all just to reduce the drag at the high end. And, you know, you can go much faster, much further with that. You start putting cameras on it, you'll get some great pictures probably, you know, but you are increasing the drag especially at the higher air speeds. You're probably reducing your glide, your L over D a little bit. Cargo pods, skydive doors, you know, big things like this, big wheels. You know, you get, say you have nine to one in your aircraft normally with this size wheel. You put this monster wheel on it, you're not going to get a nine to one ratio. You know, what it does is it changes that lift to drag curve uh, for the aircraft. So you take a look at it here, you end up having what we would call a typical lift to drag curve, you know, that looks something like this stall, as we talked about, minimum sink speed, a line on the tangent is where the best glide speed ends up occurring. You know, you do something else, you know, maybe put the big wheels on it or skydiving door or something may not change your stall speed much at all it may be identical but what it is going to do is increase the drag across all the ranges it's going to be a small change in the drag so a small change here but what you'll see is your minimum sink speed which is the top of this curve reduces down and the same thing is your tangent reduces down and because the drag is so great at the higher speeds there's less of a difference between minimum sink and best glide. You know, that's a difference. And your STC may not even tell you about that. You know, if you got an STC for really big wheels, very few of them have I seen that mention a change in the glide speed specifically for it. But if you got big wheels or a cargo door or something like that on your aircraft, you know, the manufacturer, as it came from the factory, may say best glide is 70 knots, but with all that added drag, you might find it to be actually closer to 65 knots. And that's one of the things you can do, you know, with that profile or with the graph that I give you here. If you have modified your aircraft and have a whole lot of things like antennas sticking out of it, or maybe changes in how the aircraft is set up, wheel pants versus no wheel pants, so forth and so on. All of those things have an effect on it. And you can go ahead and take a look at your particular aircraft at a particular weight and condition and figure out what it is and what, what best glide is and what it isn't. And the same with minimum sink. And how does that vary from the manual? Now, this portion of it is really probably more important to the glider pilots, but it'll help you understand as an airplane pilot, uh, what are some of the adjustments or how things change with this is, you know, kind of classic. We were talking about it. Here's your curve. We all have figured out already, you know, stall speed here, minimum sink here. 
and best glide is at the tangent from the zero point, in this case here, about 47 knots, as I'm showing you. But we also can end up in circumstances where we could end up in sinking air, such as flying in the mountains or flying over a large body of water in the middle of summer, right? You, you can kind of tell that if you ever fly in the middle of summer and you have all those fair weather puffy cumulus clouds out there, and then you fly across the middle of a lake, you might notice the turbulence subsides a bit. All the fair weather puffy cumulus clouds, you got a big blue hole with it, but you may find it takes a little bit more power <laughs> to maintain altitude and airspeed going across in, in sinking air. But in this example here, if we were flying through air with four knots of sink, how would that end up changing what would be our best glide speed? Well, you can figure that out by taking your tangent, and instead of having it start at the zero point, put it at negative four knots or negative 400 feet per minute, as we we're mentioning, and then draw the tangent to it. And what you'll find is to get your best ratio of lift to drag, i.e. distance in relation to altitude loss, you'll need to increase your speed. In this example here for this fictitious aircraft, it's like 53 knots. And this is why when glider pilots fly between one thermal and another, they fly faster. Now, the other part to this is you may notice that the slope of this line got steeper. You may have had nine to one ratio here in your glide, but the optimum that you could ever achieve, we'll say is maybe seven to one is the absolute best if you're in four knots of sync. And that will only occur at this one speed. In this example, we'll say 53 knots. So that's something to think about. Just the opposite, if we're on, say, the upwind side, you know, of a ridge that has some ridge lift occurring on it or something like that, here again is the typical zero point. But what happens if we end up having four knots of lift? We take the tangent and put it from this point and go across to the tangent here. Now you'll find the speed has not changed anywhere near as much. You know, in this case, here is about 42 knots. And here's a little tip or trick from the glider pilots. If you're in rising air to get the best ratio, you know, in terms of distance over the ground for a speed, you do want to decrease your speed in rising air, but you never, ever, ever want to decrease it below minimum sink. Yeah, that is going to be the minimum speed that you want to go to. And in this example here, believe it or not, at four knots, right here at minimum sink speed of 42, it's the same rate. And you'll notice what's the slope of this curve? <laughs> it's basically, you know, a zero. You could stay up, you're gliding in your airplane in this scenario. And I mean, it, it does happen. My son and I did it just about three weeks ago in a 172. We hung around out near Moulton Borough Airport for like five or six minutes up at 6,500 feet in a 172. We knew there was a place that was some lift and we pointed it into the wind and did slow flight or near minimum sink speed clean. And we hung out in a 172 with the engine back at idle. And I mean, over five minutes, I think we lost a hundred feet. You know, he, he looked at me and said, really, you know, we're flying an airplane, you gotta go gliding. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I have to, it looks nice. <laughs> it was a nice day out there. Now, that was important for the glider pilots, but what is really, really important for you as an airplane pilot is the changes with the wind. 
and how does that look if we were to plot it out on the curve? And we'll give you some tips or tricks here in just a minute that you can use to make it simple with it. Here's kind of the classic that we've been looking at all night, you know, with that. Now, here's an example if, say, we have um, 20 knots of headwind. All we do is we take your origin of that tangent and we move it out to the 20 knots of headwind perspective. And you'll see it hits further down on the lift to drag ratio curve in relation to it. And now what we'll find is the minimum sink speed, as always, that doesn't change in the wind. You know, it's still going to be the 44, 43 knots, whatever it is out here. But the best glide speed actually changes and gets higher. Now, how many of us fly at altitude and have had our instructors say, oh, surprise, engine out or simulated engine failure? And it's always done in absolute calm air doesn't happen. Many times what you're doing is flying into the wind, trying to get to an airport with it. You know, if that's the case, you have to increase the speed at which you fly. The other thing with it is you'll notice this slope is now much steeper. Even though the optimum speed to be flying at to get the most distance over the ground per unit of altitude is going to be higher, the ratio, the slope of the curve, is still going to be worse. Instead of having something like 9 to 1, you may only have 7 to 1 or 6 to 1, whatever it may end up being. So that's something to consider. Now, also think about this if you have a simulated engine out, is what you want to do. You want to fly faster if you're going into a headwind. And we'll talk about about how much for an easy calculation. But you also want to know you're not, nowhere never going to be able to meet the book value of, in the case of the Cessnas, as we've talked about in most GA aircraft of the nine to one. It's always going to be less. But what about with a tailwind? Let's take a look at that scenario now. Here you go. This is the classic that we've been looking at. But now we're going to do a 20 knot tailwind. And what we do is we put that out here at the zero point in relation to it. And you can already start to see the slope of this is flatter. Right away, that starts to tell us maybe we'll be able to do a little bit better than nine to one. And what we actually find is the tangent point ends up being say around 43, 44 knots on this. So we actually wanna fly slightly slower than best glide speed closer to minimum sink speed with a tailwind. So here's a couple things is with a tailwind, you want to remember, don't fly too slow. The slowest you ever want to fly with a tailwind is minimum sink speed. Really what you're doing is you fly slower and you take advantage of the wind pushing you. You know, this scenario here, it also probably tells you, you fly slower, probably give yourself a little bit more time and go further if you're dealing with an engine out and don't know where to go, if you at least turn with the wind and go in the same direction as the wind and have a tailwind. Here's just a couple rules of thumb uh, in relation to this is in a headwind, you probably want to add about 50% of the headwind component to your best glide speed. So if you're fighting a 20 knot headwind to get what is your optimum L over D going into the wind, what glider pilots call speed to fly, you probably want to fly 10 knots faster in a 20 knot headwind. In a tailwind, what you want to do is decrease your speed by about 20% of the tailwind component, but not 
below ever go below the minimum sink speed. So in a 20 knot tailwind, you probably want to go four knots slower. In a 20 knot headwind, you probably want to go about 10 knots faster. This is a little interesting thing. You know, gliders don't have the capabilities um, of engines to accelerate and decelerate with and all of that. Normally, you know, we talk about airplanes as the recommended approach speed is usually 1.3 times VSO in relation to it. Recommended approach speeds in gliders are closer to 1.5 times VSO. And depending upon who you're listening to, due to wind shear and other factors, is to add 100% of the wind component plus 100% of the gust factor to it. And here's another thing in relation to that, is think about your descent angles. Hopefully you're not, unless you're do, out doing aerobatics, you're never looking at descent angles like this, but we can give the ratio in relation to it. And here's something that a lot of people don't recognize or understand. And I hear a lot of people talking about in their airplanes about how they always want to be in a position that if the engine fails, they can make it back to the airport, you know, and they want to be on that three degree, degree glide slope. Really? You're never, ever going to, in an airplane, make the three degree glide slope. A three degree glide slope, that ratio is an 18 to one. That's twice as good as most general aviation airplanes will ever, ever be able to do, you know, is you're, you're not going to make it clean, never mind, um, you know, with flaps down or gear down or anything like that. It's actually in a low performance glider, it's pretty darn hard for a basic training glider and the primary style gliders to even make an 18 to one glide ratio. And gliders are a little bit different. Uh, airplanes don't normally have this large of a steep approach. Most airplanes are at four and a half degrees or less in terms of when they go through testing. Um, but glider certification requires that they are able to do at least a seven to one glide ratio on final. Get allow themselves to get that dirty, i.e. with the dive brakes out, flaps out, and everything like that. They they can't be better than seven to one. They have to be able to get to a condition worse than seven to one for final for approach. Old glider certification was five to one. And to give you an idea, that's a pretty steep approach. That's eight to eight degree glide slope. Now gliding wise or Best glide speed wise, we have all sorts of things available to us in nowadays. You know, if you take a look at four flight, we have the glide amoebas, uh, which has been used by glider pilots for years, but give you an idea of how far you can glide. If you do use four flight or even uh, Garmin Pilot or what is it? I want to say Seattle Avionics, you may want to take a look at what considerations they give in relation to their glide ratio, but here's a couple examples that you can see. You can tell where the wind is coming from because you really can't glide far anyway, too far into the wind. You'll also occasionally see some weird things show up. This is Mount, this was one time when I was flying in Mount Mitchell uh, down in the Southern Appalachians. You know? <laughs> and we weren't gonna be able to clear it, you know, going with the wind. And as a result, you see this split in it. And, you know, depending upon the capabilities of your aircraft and your GPS or your altitude, you may have the capabilities to glide fairly far. You know, this is a glider, not a terrific glider, but, you know, up over near Mount Washington and showing that able to glide to like Boston or even close to the Cape. And even sometimes the winds can be so strong, this is a zoomed up on it, that you you know, you can't make it unless you dramatically increase the wind. You know, if we take a look a little bit later on at like a 60 knot headwind, how fast would you need to fly in order to make it? So here's a few things. Take the knowledge you've gained here already tonight and think about this, force landing tips and 
tips and tricks is practice forced landings. You know, kind of set up your approach so that you're landing between the first and second third of the runway or landing area. And then, you know, is add your flaps and slip to move the aim point closer as it starts to go long. And you are probably better off to land long and, you know, go off the end of a landing area at 20 knots <laughs> than, than you are to ever end up short. And you want to practice these regularly. Uh, you know, it fits in. This is the 90 degree power off approach and they all relate to it. You know, you want to get out there and practice some power off landings, focus on what your key base position is and take that into account now is what speed do I want to fly based upon what the wind is doing, what my configuration is. You know, in the 180 degree approach, is one of the ones that we do probably most often. This is a required maneuver now on the commercial practical test standards. 360 degree overhead approach. And that is just adding on to the 180. And that actually comes out of the steep spiral approach, you know, which we have in the commercial practical test standards with it. Now, here's a few things as you think about this is We've talked about configuration changes. We've talked about changes in the headwind, tailwind in relation to best glide speed and minimum sink speed. What speed do you want to fly a steep spiral at? You know, as most people will say, well, the published best glide speed. Well, if you're in a 45 degree bank, your maximum L over D or best glide speed for that aircraft at 45 degrees of bank is probably going to be higher than the published glide speed. But you may find that your minimum sink speed for about that, say, 45 degrees of bank or 30 degrees, whatever it may end up being that you're flying at, is actually closer to your published best glide speed. And that's something to give consideration to. I myself, I typically, in doing this maneuver, will announce to the person what speed I'm flying planning to fly at, and I usually do fly at a speed higher than the published best glide speed. I usually am trying to fly it at the best glide speed for the banked aircraft, because flying a banked aircraft is kind of like flying an aircraft that has a shorter wingspan when you're looking at what the vertical component of your lift is. So we get a couple more poll questions as we get into the final tips and tricks for tonight. So I'll go ahead and do this is glide speed versus bank angle. And John, I'm going to need your help as always on these. You bet, Steve. I'm here. Uh, there we go. Launch that one. So please, folks, vote early, vote often. Excellent. It sounds like people were listening. So I'm going to close this one pretty darn quick <laughs> tonight. And I will share this. I didn't give you the whole minute, but that's it was becoming very, very obvious. <laughs> they were listening. Um, yes. So the answer, yes, is wonderful. The answer, it increases got 90%. It decreases got 7%. It does not change got 3%. The best glide speed for your configuration in a banked aircraft for flying that aircraft banked is going to increase. Excellent. Excellent. Oops. I got to get back to the poll. Right. You're still looking at the poll question, right? Yeah. There we go. Okay. There we go. There we go. Excellent. We'll move on to the next one. So we'll take a look at this here. We're taking a look at that circumstance. What we probably would find if we were to bank the aircraft, classically, the speed at which you stall at is going to increase. The descent rate, even at minimum sink, is going to be higher, and minimum sink speed is going to be higher, and you're going to have a lot more drag, not be able to maintain a higher airspeed, so you're going to end up with a steeper curve like this, 
and if we were to draw the tangents between the clean aircraft and the aircraft in the bank. So that's something to consider when you are doing the steep spiral. That's going to bring me to one more question um, in a forced landing poll question. I'll launch that. And this is a little bit of a trick question. <laughs> and I, I see we got a lot of people here voting quickly. So like we said before, vote early, vote often. You know, if you work for the FAA, you'd be saying, why doesn't it say it depends? <laughs> right? That's our favorite. That's our default one. Yeah. Yeah. That it is. Again, I'm going to close this one. We'll get us here to the end. I'll share that. Okay. Well, the number one answer of 41% was minimum sink. And I'll read the question. At forced landing, what speed should I fly during the setup? 41% of you thought minimum sink. 33% thought um, best glide. 23% thought manufacturers recommended uh, speed. And 1% each for VY and VX. Yeah. And this, I'm purposely, this is one of those questions that it is a classic. I, it depends but it depends upon the scenario you're in, is in your aircraft, if you're looking for maximum time aloft, you know, and you have a good place to land and you don't have to worry about something else, you know, it, you might want to fly minimum sink for a while. Most of us are trained, and especially if we're trying to get distance, you know, you might want to be at best glide. But there are some circumstances with certain aircraft that there are book speeds for other reasons. And, and here's one, you know, this is an aircraft I used to do a lot of testing in, and it's, <laughs> it's interesting because they give you multiple speeds in an emergency approach scenario. They give you at maximum gross weight for this aircraft, a best glide speed of 123 knots. But then if you've lost complete electrical power, also, what you may have done is if you're gliding in a twin engine airplane, you're having a really bad day to begin with. <laughs> you might have to do an emergency extension of the gear, which in order to get the gear down, you're going to have to go all the way up to like 200 knots in relation to it. And then if you take a look at it, is your best glide speed probably has decreased quite a bit. Depending upon your flap position, you're now down at much lower speeds. You're going a best glide that probably was close to 123, but now with the landing flaps down and the landing gear probably is closer to 98 knots. And if we take a look, this is just an example of what it looks like probably if we put the gear down. And although it's not used as often now in commercial testing, it still is used a fair amount. Back when there was the requirement specifically on the commercial and CFI practical tests for the complex aircraft, arrows were used quite often. And so many applicants were just stunned at the poor glide ratio of the aircraft. And the, you know, they sit there with they would say, why is it glide so bad and all of this? Well, one is look at the conditions. This is always important for your aircraft is do you have the gear up or the gear down? Well, they're in the pattern, so they usually have the gear down. Here's another big difference. It was a constant speed aircraft and big fat blades on it is a lot of drag with the windmilling propeller in that is their conditions for glide, best glide, was the propeller full decrease or full back. And in an arrow, you could actually feel the acceleration and deceleration if you were gliding and went from prop full forward to prop full back. You know, it made such a difference. You also will see, depending upon it, if you fly in some other aircraft like light sport, you know, usually what we'll find is low wing loadings end up equaling a low glide speed, you know light sport, something like this. I use the Piper Sport as an example in this or the Czech aircraft sport cruiser, same aircraft, has a fairly light wing loading of 10 pounds per square foot. 
most GA aircraft are in the 12 to like 18 pounds per square foot. However, it has a pretty short wingspan, has a very short arm to the elevator and large deflection capabilities. I think positive 28 degrees up on the elevator has a fairly low airspeed, big, thick Hershey bar wing. But guess what? It's surprising on how fast the best glide speed is. It's like 60 knots. And you will even find this to be the case in maybe some other types of light sport aircraft that are fairly draggy like this. So a few things to think about. How often can you really make the glide ratio that's published, you know, like that nine to one? Really, it's probably only gonna be with a tailwind. Although all of us as instructors and examiners have probably tested you on it time and time again. Here's a little side note to think about. You know, if you're thinking about that nine to one glide ratio, you're probably never really gonna achieve it. In the glider world, teaching cross countries, we actually teach to only use 50% of the published glide ratio. So if you have a glide ratio of say 40 to one and planning across country and adjusting it for it, we usually are using a 20 to one uh, glide ratio in the planning purposes and also usually taking in a worst case scenario on the wind. This is the type of stuff that you know, glider pilots are asked about and tested about on their practical test. And if you're curious about that and some of it, um, as I mentioned, some of our webinars are coming out on courses. You can take uh, ALC 612, it's called Oh No, I'm Landing Out. And you can learn a little bit more about this and maybe learn, learn a little bit more about some other factors associated with setting up to land off airport and what things you need to consider. So the takeaways for tonight is know your glide speed and ratio. Specifically, I hope you've learned is how to adjust for a headwind or tailwind as an airplane pilot. You probably also, if you have an awareness, think about it for rising and sinking air. Think about emergency landings. Are you focusing on time or distance? You know, or is it neither? You know, we mentioned that in the beginning. If you're on fire, you may want to get down now. And that's why in the ACS and practical test standards in the last few years, we've added emergency descent. Emergency landing, touching down, it's important. Try to touch down as slow as possible. Think minimum energy, you know, and usually minimum sink speed. <laughs> um, in that relation for touchdown is a maximum speed. And if you want to find out a little bit more, you can take a look at the Airplane Flying Handbook. The Glider Flying Handbook, Chapter 5, has information on this. And this is a terrific little pictorial site. Take you five minutes to go through it. It has some um, graphics along with some self-reading. But to give you a little bit different understanding or better understanding of how these performance airspeeds work, and how they work for glider pilots and how they may work for you as an airplane pilot, you can go to this website right here. I do apologize. This is where you may want to take a screenshot with it. You know, and that's, those are the places where you can learn more. If you want to learn more before that, I, if this has piqued your interest, I'd encourage you to go take some glider lessons, maybe add on a glider rating. It definitely will make you a better pilot. It'll help you understand what the rudder's for classically as you hear, but it'll help you understand a lot of the things that you do in relation to airspeed and aircraft performance. And we do want to thank you, you know, proficiency and peace of mind with the FAST team. We do ask, do something proficiency-wise, do a proficiency check, fly with an instructor at least once a year, you know, try to make for perfect practice. And if you don't have a program that you can do once a year for proficiency, we at the FAA do have the WINGS program and please strongly consider joining that. We do wanna thank you for joining us. We've had 
about 450 of you on here tonight, and I do want to thank you. You don't have to stick around, but if you want to find us, here's uh, John and I's information. And John, I'm going to ask this just because it hit me right now. I copied and pasted an old slide here, I bet, that has the old office number. Didn't it does. I? I did. I, I just looked up and I went, oops. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give it to everybody. It's 207-541-7710. Yep. That's one of the things we do this so often. Occasionally, we'll grab a slide or whatever, and you know, you don't catch it until it's too late. And I just caught it, and it was too late. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll stick around, answer any questions that you have. But do want to thank you for joining us tonight, folks. And um, please do take part in the Wings program. If you're not doing something with your flying club, the CAP, or something like that for proficiency at least once a year, John and I know it. All of us that focus on safety know it is the safer pilots are doing proficiency at least once a year, you know, get involved in the wings program, not only for joining us on things like this tonight on the knowledge side, but take the opportunity to do the flight side also. Thank you, everyone.